Hey everyone, um, welcome back. Once again, I'm with Turbo, and we are bringing you um, day two, part two of um, the Delphi hearings. Um, day two was July 31st, um, so two Wednesdays ago. And um, this is um, primarily going to focus on the testimony of the lead um, psychologist at Westville, um, Dr. Monica Wallace. Or Walla, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Hello, everyone. How are you? Mm, I'm well, Aspen. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Friday. Um, Yay. <laughs> and, yeah, and I've, I've been excited to, to go into this one. So mm, um, This is a deep dive, isn't it? It is. And, and, you know, and I know between the two of us, I think we have, you yep. know, probably a hundred pages of notes on this. So let's, yeah. um, let's, you know, jump right into it. Sure. I have, um, the, you know, she took the stand at one twenty eight PM that day. Um, this was right after the testimony. Um, if anyone's listened to the videos in order, part one ended with the, um, testimony of Jerry Holman, um, on day two. And that's just as a little bit of a background that we I've got Walla, um, um, what do you have for your background for Walla? I have that uh, they asked if it was okay that they called her doctor, which she agreed to. She's a psychologist. She was the lead psychologist. She was specifically assigned to treat Richard Allen. Um, and she had been at Westville since 2017. And she she is a licensed psychologist elsewhere as well. Um. And then that, that's what I had for the background on her. Right. And she technically is not an employee of Westville Correctional Facility. Right. She we'll is a, she's mm -hmm. a, um, you know, we'll get into it, but she's a, um, she mm -hmm. works for a company, which a lot of these, uh, a lot of um, places do this where they'll third party um, um, contract out like their um, mental health um, services. Yeah. So she actually works um, for a company that she said changes the names every three years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so she technically can go to any um, facility within the DOC, but she mainly um, um, worked at works at Westville. Um, my first notes that I really have um, other than the fact that she also does have four master level therapists that, that report to her and work under her. Mm -hmm. But that during the first month, um, from November to, to December of 2022, um, she met um, um, she met with, with Richard Allen daily. As at that point, he was on suicide watch. Yeah. Um, and then from December until April um, of 2023, she was basically meeting with him on a weekly basis. Yeah. Um, and then you know, from the months of April through August of 2023, um, she did re, um, she did go back to doing daily visits with Richard Allen or another um, behavior, um, behavioral health um, person or a psych or the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that what you have? Yeah. Yep. And she, she met with him on private, both private matters and psychological issues. Yes. And then when he arrived, when he arrived at um, Westville, he was already on suicide watch from RDC. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that had filled out the summary um, or intake form. Right. Which I think gets into the one of the arguments for the defense regarding due process, because there wasn't anything ever um, um, officially put forth um, when 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 the previous uh, Judge Benjamin Diener had. Had, had I guess you know it, there was nothing official ever done to put him on there, but right. I think we all thought we'll figure out why in a little bit here when we hear from her testimony as to kind of what went went down. Um, right. I know that the majority of the contacts that doc the majority of the contact that Doctor Walla ha had with Richard Allen occurred while he was inside of his cell. Yes. When they did the rounds, 
um, the inmates are not pulled out of their cell. Um, they do offer at least once a week for them to come out of their cell. They would, she would ask them. Um, um, and you know, I had twice, at least twice a week where she went by or, and once a week had, had been offered, uh, made the offer for him to come out. Correct. He was um, in a barred cell, which was not the A one hundred seven cell. Are, you're talking about when she went. Are you talking about when when he would he, when he would visit with her? Yep, the first time she met yeah. with Alan, uh, um, Rosie asked if it was inside or outside of the cell, and she said that it was uh, in a barred cell, and she could see him better, uh, and it was not the A one hundred seven cell, and that inc that occurred in the WC. U unit, which was uh, consisted of four pods. Uh, right. There was, you know, four Aren't pods they... with 14 in each pod for a total of 56, I guess. Right. And I, 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 I am I mistaken when I kind of in my head, when we, they were talking about that, I pictured the, um, the image that we were all shown from, I think one of the news um, stations where they showed mm. the barred, the barred cell that we kind of mm. all thought um, was representative of where he was being kept, you know? Mm, um, or do you think, or do you think that's more like the cage that she was referring to later? Yeah. I, well, okay. Um, well, there was the triangular cage, but then at Wabash, there was more of this freestanding unit. And so that's, that cell there was in what April. So that's probably so. the a one Oh seven cell, I would say, Okay. Uh, but I'd have to go back and look. Okay. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, when did they visit? I want to say it was that picture was May third, off the top of my head. I think it was the May. Right of twenty twenty. Yeah, so that would have been the A one hundred seven cell. So this was not. But A one hundred seven wasn't barred. Wasn't it? I thought it was. In that no, photo, I, I, wasn't it? In the photo, I don't. But I don't believe his. I don't believe his. Um, his normal like. Oh. You know, normal cell. Oh. I, I, I believe it consisted of, a, you know, three walls, a window, and, you know, a, and a door with a slat. But either way. Oh. Okay, um, I'm not sure. In in this instance, though, when she first had contact with him, um, it was not the A107 cell, and okay. it was in the WC unit. Okay. Um. I have a thing here about Rosie saying, can you please tell the judge about what you did with Richard Allen about confidentiality? Mm -hmm. um, to which um, Wallace said, um, filled out a confidentiality report a month after he arrived, um, mm -hmm. but that was not uncommon because his one from RDC had carried over. Right. Um, and, and, she, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, and she did testify that she briefly reviewed the uh, RDC intake form that had been done. Um, and Rosie wanted to know um, what he arrived from the re reception diagnostic center, which was, I guess, where he was put into before he was transferred to Westville. Right. And uh, he, he specifically made mention about that he wouldn't have had a pen. Right. And that's what I'm referring to when I say RDC. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, while it does say that she modified um, his orders at one point to include rec time while he was on suicide watch, what, because normally um, mm -hmm. the, those um, those types of things are completely restricted when someone is on suicide watch. Um, right. Yeah, that's right. She modified it, his suicide watch plan to allow for rec. Yes. Um, I can't. Um, and then. Um, that's when Rosie goes into um, that when he was on suicide watch, he was kept in that smock or gown um, and basically started to kind of make the illusions that it was a deterrent to do wreck um, when his, his, his private areas might be exposed. Yeah. And I do believe it was actually Dr. Walla that discussed that because I remember her saying, I think anyway, I don't, I don't have it noted, but I, I think that it was um, a deter it is a deterrent for rec because that their private par parts could be exposed. So maybe he, he asked her if she agreed with that and she said right. yes. Yeah, yeah, Rosie, yeah, Rosie is definitely the one that um that okay. um brought the um the yeah. 
like that so she, that aspect of it and yeah and so she, did, she said that she would uh, it was possible to get stuck in rec if there was administrative issues mm -hmm. so maybe I don't know if that actually happened but she did make mention of that during that portion and I just wanted to ask before we move on do you have anything about the waivers because there was waivers mentioned when they were discussing the confidentiality and Rosie brought up that there were there were eight things I I only grabbed three of them which was self-harm harming others harming someone else in the facility in the facility and those waivers remain confidential unless um, one of those eight things um, might be a, a group therapy issue. There was something mentioned about that, and, yeah. and that's all I had about on that. I all I had written down for that is that um, was the eight waivers, and then I had an, a side note that said, um, "I'm sure that's public information. I can look up later um, yeah. to see what to see what the list of those standards are." Okay. But I do I do remember vaguely what um, the mentioning mm -hmm. something about the the group that group therapy sessions um i have okay. that after the after the little um talk about you know how he how he you know it was, it was a deterrent to do rec time because his private parts might be exposed um diener um it's Diener did object and said this is not relevant. Um, his mental health professional is not a part of his rec time. Um, Rosie, before Judge Gold could say anything, said, I'll move on. Um, Rosie brings up the fact that on videos that he's seen, um, that, you know, he oftentimes see Richard Allen pacing back and forth, which is 15 steps each way, wall to wall. Um... He says, yeah. mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, Rosie did ask uh, Dr. Wall if she observed any of the videos, and she did say yes, that she did. Mm -hmm. um, and then Rich, and then Rosie said, um, he brought up the, the lights being on 24 hours a day. And we'd already heard, you know, mention of that at one of, you know, one of the um, prior hearings the day before, I think. Um to which Walla responded um, that Richard Allen said he didn't want to turn the light off. Um, in case he would get in trouble. Yes. That's, yeah. Um, it was brought up by um, Brad Rosie that, um, that, you know, wouldn't she agree that Richard Allen had no view out of the, out of the window at his cell, except for barbed wire. Mm -hmm. Um, and special that, you know, view, a special view of barbed wire for Richard Allen was the quote. Yes, <laughs> and yeah. then, and then um, he he um, brought up the fact that, and actually, th this is the point I probably would have made more more of a, a case about is he said Richard Allen dealt with things like um, like that, but even bugs and mice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd rather take a, a bad view than you mm -hmm. know rodents, um, but he then said. It's enough to make a man go crazy, right? Right, right. Question mark. And, and, then, and, but, yeah. and then Wallace said, <laughs> then Wallace said, well, that define, that depends on how you define crazy, but it can be de-stressing. Right, yeah. And he, the term he used specifically, Rosie used, was fighting with bugs and, and with the mice, mouse droppings. So <laughs> thought that was interesting. He was... He was in a war in there with the with the mice. That's the way it right. sounded. <laughs> but they, but he, they didn't put much of an emphasis on on that actually. And I, you know, if, mm. if there's legitimacy there, I like I would have focused more on that. But yeah. Um, but that's uh, just a side note of mine. I did find their back and forth about a you know her um, saying you know depends on how you define crazy. Right. Um, yeah. She said could, if you if you mean it can make a man distressed, then yes. Yeah. Um, we then have exception to the use of the word crazy there. Well, I would hope, as a mental health professional, I would hope that she does. Yeah. Hold yeah. on one second. Mm hmm.
And um, the next thing I have here is that, um, wait, right. Oh, there was, this is when um, we heard mention of that inmates would routinely um, tell Richard Allen to um, kill himself when he was passing by and being transported and that, you know, and that he was called baby killer. Yep. Yeah, and, and Dr. Walla testified that it bothered her that that was happening and that it was very noisy and and all of that did add uh, a, a substantial amount to the noises that he was experiencing. Right. So he was afraid to, to use the dimmer switch in his cell to turn the lights off, apparently, even though he had access to it and could. Um, and that, you know, and, you know, of course it would be distressing to have people to call you to, have yeah. people call you those horrible things, but right. yeah. sadly, I don't think that's going to be, um, mm. I, I don't see go it. Away. I think that's going to happen wherever he's, he, he's yeah, being absolutely. held at. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, I have the, she discusses the intake form. Rosie calls it, um, an informal or casual 15 minute combo. Um, whereas Walla, um, clarifies, she would call it a structured interview. A structural right. interview, yeah, no structured interview. Right. It wasn't a real clinical process. Uh, Rosie right. seemed to really want to clarify that. Right. He, he asked her if she was familiar with Rick's psychological issues, and she responded, uh, yes, and that he had heart issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the major depressive disorder came up at this point from Rosie and Walla stated that it was not to their standards that sh she would have to disagree um, that Alan had been suffering for a long time since early adulthood um, that, that he was suffering from depression, but it right. doesn't sound like it. I don't know. That's what I had written down about the major depressive disorder. It, it could be defined as that. I have that um, at age 25, apparently, he was already taking psychotropics. Yeah. Um, and that in 2019, um, he had uh, um, he spent more than one week mm -hmm. in a hospital for mental health. Yeah, um, and he, yeah, and Alan had told Dr. Walla that. Right. And so these are, you know, these are some of the prior um, health and mental, mental health um, things that helped go help make her make th her decisions on, you know, his treatment and things like that. Um, and I'm yeah. an opinion on, but because she actually even, even though she didn't clinically say this, she even to herself thought um, that, you know, he may suffer from bipolar. Granted that, that was just her opinion and not even, you know, one put out there professionally. She just mentioned it on the stand that she had thought that to herself. Um, he also suffered anxiety. Um, and that's the point where they bring, um, they brought up how tied together his mental health seems to be with, with the relationship between him and his wife. So um, just before you get into that, there was one thing that Rosie asked about, um, if, if Richard Allen had suicidal ideation prior to being admitted and Walla stated that she believed so. And then Rosie introduces the record for generalized anxiety disorder and also dependent personality disorder. Wallace stated that it was it was a possibility some of the signs were there, being um, you know being separated from loved ones and from his wife Kathy. Yes, and so that's what I was leading, leading into was the um, it was the codependent. Um, um, uh, that I'm um, Rosie brought up. Um, Walla classified Richard Allen um, as the highest level of mental health um, treatment that the DOC could accommodate a patient or an inmate without sending him out to a psychiatric facility. And she said there are five um he, he was class D. Yeah, sorry. Did you say she assigned him as the, the highest one? Second, the second to highest. Because I have six designations, A, B, C, D, E, and F. D is what he was assigned, was assigned, and F was the most acute, um, whereas he would be transferred out of the facility and usually to Newcastle, where which is where they would send the most acute patients. 
I, I have in I mean, my in my I, notes. I, maybe I had that wrong. Maybe it was only five. I, I maybe I added right. F. I don't know. Did you have five? I had the highest classes E, and that he was D. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe and that, I misheard that number. And that the reason that she said, but she said it the highest they could. They it's the second highest there is in their system. Okay, but it's the it must highest. That it's the highest um, um, level that they could accommodate without at least ha sending him out to a psychiatric facility okay. and then coming back. Yeah. So, like, you know, basically, rather than being transferred fully, they'd probably send him somewhere for observation or to get another ass assessment. Yeah. Um, that um, that Richard Good, Allen was not that, that mm -hmm. Richard Allen was not actively um, suicidal when he was brought to Westville. Um, but that based on his hi history and situation, um, and the fact that RDC had already classified him as this, they had him on suicide watch. Right. He, Rosie said from a mental health standpoint, he was fragile, um, when he was committed and, and well agreed. And then Rosie asked if he was quote, an eggshell inmate, would that be accurate? And she agreed and said, sure. Right. Um, Wallace said that he was placed in the safest cell that they had to fit his condition. Yeah. Right. Um, which is an administrative cell. That's she specifically stated he would be in that cell anyway, because the administrative cell is also the suicide cell. So right. when you hear about this, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's been a lot of discussion out there, you know, in the general public about this. And that's why this testimony is so important because you get to the real grit of it. You know, he wasn't actually, actually suicidal, but he was a high risk. His privileges were limited to an extent um, over time where they would monitor. And they ended up uh, early to mid December of 2022 they stepped it down to 15 minute intervals of close observation. Correct. And that actually um, starting in January of 2023, mm -hmm. lasting until April of 2023, they um, took him off suicide watch. Right. Um, and that's critical, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it is. He's still in the same cell though, because he was right, because it was the safest place they had. They couldn't put him in gen pop. Right. So you, um, the you know, the you question, hear all these times that everybody likes to tell, well, he was, been, he's been in there, you know, basically since he was incarcerated, he was in for this huge length of time and this in segregation and isolation and this and that. Well, he was in the safest cell they had as opposed to going out into the gen pot. Correct. Like, I mean, you know, and that's a, that's a key thing. January to April of 2023, he was, he still had, he just had companion inmates assigned for administrative purposes because he was, you know, but assigned why? that classification and he was not assigned suicidal. Right. So those, that's really key in, in the whole scheme of things. So it was great to hear right. that for me. I, I mean, like I said, I did put a big question mark next to why, you know, and, you know, maybe you just answered it, but I did, you know, I did have questions about that if he's not on suicide watch, then why? Why are they still having him observed by um, yeah. companions? Yeah, um, I have a April huge note on it. it. It was the safest cell they had. He would be in that cell anyway. Right. I just wanted to know about this, the, the companions. Mm. But as far as like um, 2023 yeah. um, in April is when he goes back on to suicide watch. Um, and that's funny enough is when the, um, the, the companions are actually pulled off of of his um, supervision yeah. and the guards are brought in. Right. Um, he was um, given a, um, a suicide blanket, mm -hmm. which um, um, uh, attorney Rosie um, asked Walla if she would agree is not a luxury item. Um, Walla is not authorized to make executive decisions without administration, without administration. Um, and I have a question mark there, but I'm not sure why I, why I have one. Um, so I, 
he, his restrictions fluctuated, is what she testified. There, uh, four to five hours of rec time is the standard. Uh, and and re- with respect to the suicide blanket, technically they're Correct. supposed to take them away. So it sounds like maybe that didn't happen. It didn't really get, they didn't really get into the specifics. Um, but she stated that we, when we send orders, they see that we want a companion inmate for him. Um, and then she made a comment about it, it doesn't have anything to do with that program. I think maybe referring to the blanket or something. And okay. then Rosie says, were there problems from the beginning? And she says, yes. And Rosie says, the inmates were talking to them, weren't talking to him, weren't they? And she says, yes. Yeah. And there was at least right. one instance of a companion telling his family um, um, details of discussions. I don't, it wasn't confess. I, she didn't specify. That comes later though, I thought. No, but it came right there. But we get into that later with the confessions. But okay. it sounds like the companion was, you know, discussing the, you know, the high profile uh, inmate that he was a companion to. Now, I don't know if it's uh, the fella that we, we get into later. It didn't, wasn't specified at this point. But Alan was frustrated with those companion violations and, of the companion. And so was Walker. Walker. And so was Walla. Right. Um, and Rosie Walla, asked if, he, if she reported them and she said she didn't think that she did, that they didn't, they, we don't have any control over that. Right. Um, Rosie asked um, Walla, quote, can you trust the word of a suicide companion based on their past? And Walla um, responded, no, that's fair. Um, it um, violates the program rules, but it's not a perfect system and it could be better. Yep. Um, in she April said of 2023. The way system works. Yes. And she, I mean, she was very frank about that as far as, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, yeah. I think, I think a lot of people can agree that, you know, yeah. m- most, most, most DOCs are cr- around the United States have, you know, are, are not perfect. And so I can't imagine, you know, how much more so someone like in her position would feel, um, because they really see how unperfect they can be. Right, and, and um, she actually testified that it's a DOC anyway, I, program. And uh, since Alan had left, that they had now made an entire new position uh, for that job to oversee, I guess, the pl- the, the PLUS program was, was the old program where the inmates got paid. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, And again, I, I kind of had a WTF moment when I read the, uh, <laughs> the you know, what do you mean they're paid? Like, why are they paid? But, um, yeah. um, I, you know, the, that's when we also brought up the Goldman, um, friend who is a forensic clinical psychiatrist hmm. from ISP apparently oh. tried to initiate, um, tried to initiate contact in March of 2023. Mm-hmm. Um, Walla, um, both because she wanted to and because I think she was a, she was supposed to, um, she left the decision up to Richard Allen himself. Um, access was not granted, and in her words, nothing came from it. Right. Yep. This, it was it, shut down. Another, yeah, and there's another reference to it later on that that um, that that actually makes it sound like well, we'll get to that in, during the cross. But um, um, what what she did say, state that I wrote down was she says, as we talk about it, I do remember it. I don't think it would be appropriate to talk to the state police. Right. And she um, specifically stated that Alan made the decision and she was in agreement. Yeah. And she said and Rosie asked her, did the state police ask for info? And she said no. Right. I think she even said later that she she was not she she was never interviewed by um, by investigators, you know, during the time that he was at um, Westville. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a side note here that just says, you know, Walla comes off very professional, warm, articulate. Um, she's smiling. She seems honest um, and genuine as she speaks. Um, that was my personal assessment to what I you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, other people may. That. Other people may have thought differently. That's just what I saw. 
Um, and then they go into the therapy area at Westville, which is a triangular three by three in Walla's word cage. Um, they're four sided at Wabash, but they're actually even smaller at Wabash um, with bars. And that's when we found out Walla knew that because she went to visit Richard Allen even after he was transferred to Wabash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rosie yeah. was on, kind of on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Walla testified that she never did um, therapeutic care mm -hmm. with Richard Allen, but that she did give him literature about anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. a book called Man man's search for his meaning or meaning i'm not sure um which if anyone looks up is actually i i found it interesting it's a book about someone surviving a concentration camp um mm. coloring pe uh, colored pencils and crayons and uh, crossword and crosswords yeah yeah and alan yes. took those from her um I then have the note that she, um, the company she actually works for is called Centurion, Centurion, mm -hmm. um, and they run all of the mental health for the DOC. Um, she can hop in between facilities if needed, um, which is why she probably had access to him even at Wabash. Um, she used to work uh, the prior contract. The prior name for Centurion. So it sounds like what they would do is make a new company, maintain the contract <laughs> <laughs> every three years when it came up for bid. Every three years is when it came up for, for tender. And Wexford Health was the prior name, and Horizon Health was also yeah. a prior name for Centurion. Now, Aspen, is, th is this where um, your notes are currently? Because I do have a few other notations after the crossword and colored pencil stuff. Um, um, no, the, I, the next, the, um, the next thing I have is goes into how she would, um, memorialize their, okay. their, um, their communications. So I do have a few things if I could add, cause there were absolutely. Some, okay. Um, so Rosie asked if they were limited to conversations uh, medications and discussing suicide and Wallace stated that in re the restrictive housing unit yes um, if anything was needing to be prescribed the psychiatrist handled that she did a lot of talk therapy with uh, psychological interventions and she stated that it's very important to talk about suicide um, while Alan was waiting for the cage he had the belly chain box cuffs that's the way uh, they would take him to meet with her in the cage. Um, she stated that she did not talk to Alan about exceptions to the doctor-patient -pati privilege. And then Rosie brings up six points here, and I, I, I think it was Rosie. I, there, it was harm to self, uh, discussions about harm to self, others, property, drug trafficking, sexual abuse of children, and inappropriate sexual relationships. And he he must have asked her about that. I don't have specifically um, how this went down, but she did respond, I don't remember it, but I must have talked to him about those things. And she says, did you take notes while he was in the cage? And she said, sometimes. Right. So that's then, where my notes are caught up to, too. Right. So she she said um, that he asked her about, she, he says, tell Judge Gull about how Centurion Health employs health care uh, for all inmates of the pris prison, and you would have a badge and get paid by Centurion. And, and as you mentioned, be able to go to other facilities, not just Westville. So you can continue on there regarding the notes. Well, actually, why don't you why don't why don't you do your notes for that part, and then I'll I'll see if I have something different. Okay. Um. So Dr. Wallace stated that she took notes and then would make a report within 24 hours and enter it into the system. She stated that she would shred her notes after. And Rosie asked her, "Are those notes the best record of what Rick told you?" And she said, "Yes." 
And she said um, when he was first arrested, he would generally proclaim his innocence. He stated that he was worried about his wife. Uh, this is where she comes on to say about the traits of the dependent personality disorder. In December of 2022, uh, he started to express that he was being treated worse. In March of 2023, he stated that he wasn't feeling right. He wasn't feeling right in his brain. But she said that he very much had a baseline for for this type of uh, depressive behavior, uh, his right. base baseline for his normal depression, and that wasn't really out of the norm for him. Right. And then, of course, we get to uh, April fourth of tw of uh, twenty twenty three. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I have is that you know she specifically um, noted that something she um, observed when he was brought to Westville that he had that he had strong traits of self um, selflessness. Um, and that he was very concerned about his wife. Um, and then we went into the, the March thing about not feeling right in the head and, and his baseline being depressive. And then, um, from her notes on April 4th, I have a list of things that she says, um, as, as far as fatalistic delusions, suicidal ideologies. I'm not sure if that's my, my scribble, mm -hmm. um, or, then delusions, insomnia, worthlessness, hopelessness, self-esteem issues. And that actually on April 3rd, she, he seemed to be suffering from a grave disability. Sorry, which date did you have? Um, April 3rd was the grave disability and April 4th was that list of, of mm. traits that she, um, that she observed. Okay, well, what I have is I have three dates for April. April 4th with all those that you just detailed. I think there was one that uh, I wrote down that you didn't have. Death would bring him relief. He had fatalistic delusions or fantasies and a poor mm -hmm. appetite as well, poor self-esteem. Then I, got, I have April 12th, 2023. His Behavior became more bizarre. He started banging his head, self-injurious, kicking the doors. And on April 13th is when I have grave disability. Now, because oh, of the right. way my night... Yeah, okay. okay. It is I April 13th. It the, and, 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 of course, the only reason I, I state this, it seems important, of course, because of what, what transpired in this whole timeline of... No, I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I we want, get into... That makes more sense about why I would have it written after April 4th anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I have the April 21st is when Walla, um, quite personally to herself, questions his competency to mm -hmm. actually stand trial. And that's when he's been eating his own de decrement de de um, and won't stop banging his head. He had thoughts that were disjointed along with the bizarre behavior. And she, Walla did state that, that they we are not the ones qualified to make the determination of whether he's competent to stand for right. trial and, and her specifically. Um, and one more thing, this was at the, after we went through the April, the little bit of April uh, chronological events there, Rosie approached um, Dr. Walla at the witness stand and pulled out the big binder and referenced page 136, uh, numbers 8 to 11 regarding suffering from grave disability. There was a discussion on that and, mm -hmm. and she said yes. So then there was, they got into voluntary or involuntary psych, uh, psychiatric medications with sticking right. a needle in him. And then he became emergent uh, for being involuntary. There was more than one time that he was banging his head to get to sleep. Right. Um, and as we, and you know, something that I, you know, it's nice to keep in mind too is, as you know, as we look over these dates later, when um, you know, in the, in our next um, in our next hearing um, update, which will be the um, Harshman um, testimony a lot of these dates will come back up because you'll see mm -hmm. that they correlate with other um, important events, you know, mm -hmm. in the things he was saying to his family, to the companions, to other people um, 
So, you know, it really does kind of go into what, you know, like how, how much of a psychosis was he in it, you know, during what dates, um, in relation to the statements he was making. So, um, I've got, I've got it up to then that they initially, they initially believed that they would, um, they would give him the treatments every two to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Is that what you have? Yep. Um, and that on May 3rd, um, Dr. Walla noted that he, he said to, um, he said to Dr. Walla that he wanted to confess he, and he wanted, um, um, and he wanted to say how he did it. Right. Um, how he did the crime. Yes. Yep. How he did yep. it. Yep. Um, and she at times questioned if he was being dishonest or not. I and made that what, notation. That's when she made the notation of, she, but she didn't clarify it as far as because I was like, you know, was she referring to that he he that he was being dishonest about wanting to confess, or hmm. w- was that just something that she would noticed throughout her care of him that there were times he felt she felt like he, the things he said were not being honest. Um, yeah, good point. I, I've got the next date on there and you'll see us pop back to another date or two. Yes. Yeah. We'll be coming back to May 3rd. (laughs) Yeah. But May 17th, um, I've got that. She, um, she observed a slight increase in his paranoia. Um, and disorganization. Yep. And then on the 18th, he was given another injection, Mm -hmm, which was routine. And on page 177 of, of her deposition. Right. We, we, we later find out it was Had, Hadol. Hadol, is that how you pronounce it? Halidol. Halidol. Um, but we don't know that yet at this point in the, in the, in the hearings. Um, May 22nd, um, psychotic stress reaction. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, I have that. Yep. Um, and that on June 8th, she thinks is when he reached the peak of his mental instability. Yeah. Um, and I have knees something, and I can't knees, read the uh, word. Buckling. <laughs> buckling. Knees buckling, yeah. Knee, knees buckling and ramming his head into the wall or door. Yeah, and trembling and stuttering. Yes. Psy- psychotic reaction to stress. And one thing that did uh, was discussed, he was due for his next injection in two to four weeks at that time. Rosie asked if injections were pretty rare numbers-wise, and she said they're not common. We have them. There's about a dozen people out of 3,000 in the population of Westville. Um, but in an emergent situation, uh, I have zero. I, I, I don't think, I guess, there hadn't been any emergent situations. And then she did make a comment about we did also have that restraints situation um, and that you reported on May 18th. Right. Which and I'm I'm assuming does that mean they had to actually put him in restraints to give him his injection on the 18th? Sounds because like because because he did he did receive an injection on the 18th. Okay, um, that's it then I guess. I mean, I mean I'm that's I'm just assuming. That's what I have it. in my notes. Like read in with that. So I think on so. um on July 11th of 2023, Walla notes that um she's starting to see his mental health. Um, returning to its normal mm-hmm. and you know she says it you know his normal because that's not going to be the same for everyone um and rosie Ro- referred to it as coming out of the funk right and then rosie said something about his eyes bulging out of his head yeah and um walla said um oh because he said do you have anything in your notes about richard allen's like eyes bulging out of his head and walla said I had noted changes throughout my care of him that I would see um, changes in his in his eyes, meaning both the color and the size of his eyes. Wow! Um, and it's something she noticed um, hmm. and throughout her care of him. Well, I that think wasn't a direct. That, quote, that wasn't a direct. <laughs> yeah, and that was not a direct quote. I was, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. The bulging was though, and, and you're right. Rosie had asked about it. Yeah, and but, she you know, it. yeah, she and she said she had noted changes throughout her care of him on his eyes. 
Um, so one thing he, he di- Rosie did ask is, um, and and you 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 noted that uh, he had adjusted to being an offender, and she said that was my theory, and then he said eight months, and then, and then she said yes, it would be. So he was discharged from the suicide plan November 22nd of 2023. Right. Well, in, and, you know, before that, in October of 2023, that's when he quoted, he's quoted um, as telling Dr. Walla, I've already been convicted of this crime. Yeah. Um, in November of 2023, he also had a, reg- he also had a, a regression and started to become more depressed um what date aspen november of 2023 okay i must have missed that um i have a question okay well i was just gonna say and this is uh, this is you know something a correlation i may just you know that that did that timeline also would correspond with his attorneys being removed from the case you know, oh. so I'm not saying that's why he was, uh, you know, re- that's why he had any regression or, or seemed uh, depressed, but yeah. that is, wi- that is the time that, oh, that, you know. Oh, good, good. That's a fantastic observation. Um, yes. G- good job on that. I just want one clarification from you. Yes, please. Okay. You said, uh, now here's what I had written about you. I think you used a different word there. You said convicted. I have that he said that he he's already been sentenced for this crime statements by Alan didn't know you had convicted though. Did I they- have, I've, I've, I have, I've already been, and I have it in quote quotation marks, but yeah. I, I can, oh, I've shit. already been convicted of a crime. <laughs> we both that- have, Oh, yeah, but no, yeah, that's that- okay. I just wondered myself. Like I just wondered if I, you know, right. I- and that's so, that's the funny thing, you know, two people <laughs> sitting, sitting yeah. next to each other in a courtroom yeah. can, <laughs> And, and yeah, and you get into your own, you know, it's really hard at times not to put your own. I try really hard not to. Yeah, but, of course. We um, both do. Yeah. And if, and if I do make an observation, it's, I always try to note that, that this is something I'm thinking and not, you know, not something that is being um, testified mm-hmm. to. Cause I really just want to be, put the factual things of what oh, was testified yeah, for sure. to. I was just curious. Um, because that was kind of a profound statement. I have one right. thing to say though. Your, your, your film projector. Maybe, maybe we could adjust it. <laughs> My film projector. Yeah. Your fan. I, I chatted to you there. Oh yeah. Your, your fan is a little bit, um, crick, rickety. <laughs> it's that one. It's that, it's just hitting up against the side of the. <laughs> is, is that better? It is. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I asked her if I could, if you could hear my fan, and um, um, I guess it got too loud. It just um, has a bit of an ambient noise there, Aspen. Still. Mm-hmm. Is it any better now? It's just. Um, I'm just not sure if your listeners are going to, I mean, I don't care. I'm just not sure if the listeners are going to hear that because it's, it's kind of a affecting the, the audio. It started to. Well, if, if it's the, um, if it's the cicadas or whatever I'm hearing outside of the locust, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> um, Did you say cicada? Or whatever they are. What, you know. No, I'm not. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not. I don't think it's that. Did you turn the fan off? <laughs> yeah, I turned the fan off. Weird. Okay. So, um, the next thing I have is that in that she must have had made a no- notation from April, which, um, and I'm assuming this was going back to April of 2023, um that you know she would classify as he suffered a psycho- psychiatric mental break um april 2023 mhm okay and that was the last thing i because that was when she was just kind of they were going through like what she'd kept from her notes um and then it's when rosie said um SMI. Um, okay, hold up one sec. Oh, okay. 
right before you get to the SMI, um, I'll just add a couple things that I had. There was uh, Dr. Walla discussed um, him being badgered and uh, by the other inmates when he was being escorted from his cell. And then they got into the treatment team reports with Dr. Martin. And uh, those were discussed in the deposition, but and she specifically said, we're not supposed to talk about them now. Uh, you, you know, you had to have a lawyer. Um, is that normal? And then she said, Rick was a unique experience, specifically is what she said. And th there was an abrupt onset of psychosis, March, April, May leading up to the psychotic uh, in, involuntary injection. And th there are a number of reports that say that. And that that's Rosie quoting their catatonic behavior and disorganized speech. One note specified that he was identified as having a serious mental illness. And then you can take it away on the SMIs, which stands for seriously mentally ill. There was a, a specific um, diagnosis or de designation within the restricted housing unit of the SMI. And then Wallace stated that she didn't know if she was supposed to say anything about that. And this got into a pretty important part that at the time I was quite confused of because there was a lot of discussion of him being a safekeeper. Um, and Wallace stated that he was designated, they, they designated him as a safekeeper. So there was like two prongs. You had the psychologist and their criteria for an right. SMI. And then you had the safekeeper and he was removed from that SMI uh, designation. Right. So it sounds like there was a bit of. How, how, right. did, how did you take all that? I took the safe. Key, I took the. the it was a um, basically red tape. I basically, you know, basically have you have the health, the mental health side of it, and then you have the administra mm. administrative administrative ah. side of it. Okay, so yeah, that's even a good though, analogy. Yeah. Even though they removed the SMI aspect, they kept the safekeeper. So he basically still then was kind of contained to a lot of the same um, restrictions at, as he would have been if he was still considered an SMI. Um, but again, neither of us are a correctional mm. um, officer, yeah. nor are we mental health professionals. But, <laughs> Definitely. Um, but, but, you know, but that's what was testified in, in court. Um, in her opinion, um, that, um, yeah, RA is, has rules about the solitary, but that um, he's classified as a safekeeper. Um, it was mentioned about how there are exceptions to the 30 day rule. If they are deemed, if, if they are deemed to um, be considered to be dangerous or if they're put in gen pop, that was at 244. Diener then objects to relevancy um, and asks Rosie to focus his, to focus his questions. Um, so just stepping up, if that's where you're at, I just wanted to go back before, okay. before we continue on with that. Um, following up on the, on the designation of like, as you say, from a mental health perspective or an administrative perspective, Rosie states, it doesn't really change what's, what's really going on in his brain though. Right. And so I thought that right. that was that was a that was a valid point because they have their pros to me like they like as you say they have their their way of in the system designating and how to handle him but in the end it didn't really change what was going on with him you know and so and then they had gotten into um, the strict timelines for how long that they are in solitary uh, Wallace stated she was very familiar with the SMI designations. And then he asked um, if it was widely studied in your profession and like, basically if there was a, a special side of the mental health aspect for, for regarding solitary effects. And she stated that there's no subspecialty for that. Um, and he got into 
the hole, as some inmates call it. It's not a men it's not a positive mental health treatment, is it? And and she agreed. And then he said it would have a negative effect on someone suffering from pre-existing mental health conditions, wouldn't it? And she says yes. And then he says 30 days is the threshold, right? Yep. When someone puts a hat on you and says you're a safekeeper. You know, so in other words, it was you're back to the battle between the administrative side of things and the and the and the you know the mental health side. And she stated that no, if if he was dangerous physically, uh, the, you know that's where the, it comes into play about the solitary, and. And Rosie brings up about solitary making it worse a lot of times. And then he gets into the lawsuit for the IPAS versus uh, the IDOC. and Or sorry, IDOC versus IPAS. And, and then you had your deaner object, objecting on coercion or being induced by his environment. We are so Correct. far afield. I waited and waited. And Judge Gall said... Certainly. And Rosie brings up about the Fifth and Sixth Amendment process and says it's directly relevant. That there was a settlement for the IDOC versus IPAS. And then he references the 2016 uh, Indie um, Division for Tommy Walton Craft, I believe it was. I believe so. Um, and this is also where he, he make he make he asks if he may make an offer of proof. And they um, and they put in Exhibit T which is a bench trial court order lawsuit between IDOC and IPAS. Um, is that where you, you have as well there? Yes, and I do have that Judge Gall says that's not a, prof a proper offer of proof for right. Walla. And, and then um, Rosie says um, judicial um, notice. Mm -hmm. Gall says, I will take your judicial notice. Um, and then he starts to walk back to the, um, to the defense table. And then he stops and he goes back and he says, oh, did I hand you the wrong thing? <laughs> Gull said, I don't know. And then she says, it's your offer, not mine. And kind of put her <laughs> hands up in the air. Um, and then Rosie at 2, um, 55 says, can we take a break? Um, Gull says, well, how much more do you, how much, how much more do you have to go? And Rosie said, well, I, I can go another 10 minutes or so. And that's when they decide to take the afternoon break, um, which lasts from three ten to or three to three ten. Do you have anything in between there? I do, but where do you? I didn't notate the break. So where do you pick up after the break? Because I do have some. I'll only go up to the break. Where do you start back after the break? Um, I start back with Diener's Cross, basically. Um, okay. Um, where she Diener's um, says Richard Allen was diagnosed with brief psyche. Um, um, psychiatric or psycho psychological disorder with triggers. Um, and, it, and Wallace said it was determined in meetings that I have not talked about. Okay. Um, that he I've would remain you. at Westville. Okay. So there was a bunch of discussion, um, after we talked about, uh, after judge Gall had made the joke that it's your offer of proof. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, they got into uh, the case, the settlement of the IDOC versus um, IPAS, and Judge Pratt, uh, sorry, Judge Pratt, <laughs> I don't know if it's Judge Pratt, I have these names I couldn't quite hear, Judge Kraft, Judge Pratt, identified specific conditions, and then Rosie asked, are you familiar with DSM-4? And Wallace said, DSM-5-TR is current. And then Rosie stated it's the settlement, though, for IDOC versus IPAS. And she says, major depression did not fall under that settlement. There must have been an update because my coworker had told me about it. And then, because Ro Rosie's argument um, was, she he was countering on this, um, you know, it was not a proper offer of proof. And Rosie turns to Judge Gull and says, I do think that she does have a foundation judge. And so then he gets into DSM 4.03, um, April 21st, 2022. It was dated page two. Um, 
section H was which was the I pass settlement uh, seriously mentally ill inmates specifically and that's the basis that's the basis of what he was trying to get at there and then we then we went to break sorry I just had I, I didn't really know a lot about what that was all getting into there, but it, it seemed important, like, with respect okay. to those codes. So maybe somebody else that's listening can shed some light on that for well, us. App apparently, as soon as I heard the word break, my mind checked out. because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even write down about the break. Yeah. Um <laughs> Because, I mean, there there were definitely times, you know, that you know, like be, you know, like being tall and sitting in those little chairs, and then like, you know, trying to stretch my legs out, and then like lift your butt up so you're not like sitting on the hard seat the whole time. I think everyone was ready to take those breaks um, when we rarely got them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that brings brings us up to the afternoon break, correct? Yep. Okay, and that's when then um, Diener um, mm -hmm. says. Richard Allen was diagnosed with brief um, psychiatric or um, I think, do you have a psych, what do you have there? I have brief psychotic disorder psychotic. with stressors. With stressors. Okay. Um, and then now, the she was quoting that. So this is the yes. point where Diener pulls out the huge binder which yes. contained the, the hard copies. I, I, I mean, we don't know what it was, but she kept, opening the binder and pulling out certain um, reports that Dr. Walla had done, and she would present them to her periodically. And so this is when the big binder started to get referenced on, right. on cross-exam from Diener, and that was specifically. And the brief psychotic... Uh, Alan did not meet the def def uh, definition for the SMI, um, and there was reference to the deposition and then in, today in whose, in whose determination do you remember? Um, so it doesn't, uh, less than 30 days for the SMI. It doesn't meet the SMI designation. The symptoms had to go on for a certain length of time technically on the definition alone it would have been a new diagnosis for him so okay. then that, yeah okay that makes sense so um, then walla gets into the meetings that she says i'm not supposed to talk about he did not uh well did meet. she say not supposed to talk about or did she say that i have not talked about she said that I'm not to talk about. And oh. again, she also had an attorney present during her testimony. And I didn't note if it was the same attorney. Like, I think some of them. Did you happen to make notations on the attorneys that were representing the witnesses? Because I think I would think that it would have been the same one that was with um, the warden Gallipo during his testimony. Um, because they would have been representing the state. Uh, maybe not though, because she was employed by, I don't know. She was employed by a contract, a third party. So actually I didn't note who the attorney was, but she definitely, she did have one. Right. So I found that, I, I, so I did find that interesting and I'm not saying there was anything nefarious there. I just, you know, it could be something as simple as that being a detail that, you know, still falls under some sort of protective thing they don't want to bring mm. up and you know oh yeah they need um, the doc but, like the doctor will testify to that at, right. at trial or otherwise right is the way i took it i mean right. that's great that was my you know layman's um, observation of all that so i have a so i thought there was a very big um i thought that i i, I well you know i thought there was a very interesting um kind of change in tone because if you'll remember, Dr. Walla um, came in as a defense witness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we spent the first portion of her testimony um, yeah. basically kind of like laying out her, um, her experience. Um, we then see, I think, now that we're on cross, um, we're going to hear some of those same references, the things we already heard in, before they went on break. Rosie's tone and the way uh -huh. he um, kind of goes goes. Um, of course, the, the way he approaches the witness is um, is I thought was very um, interesting, and I thought he did a very good job at it, mm -hmm. um, just personally. Mm -hmm. But um, that yeah, was when we I get into the confessions themselves, right? And so at three twenty eight um, p.m., um, Brad Rosie um, says, "Well, 
you followed this case on social media closely, correct? Oh, Facebook. hold up there. Oh, okay. that's important. That's all really important. I just had a couple things noted. Oh, if go that's ahead. Where you're gonna go? I just had a few more things here. Um, so, so while it's discussing the meetings that I'm not to talk about, um, um, he did not have a new diagnosis. Alan was not an IDOC incarcerated individual. He was a safekeeper. His designation as a safekeeper was a priority. Um, he had a brief psychosis di di uh, di <laughs> diagnosis, and that was successfully treated. Um, Rosie um, was referencing, uh, does he need to be moved to some sort of a facility? And then um, Judge Gall says, we've gone, uh, we've gone way far afield here. And he says, well, there's a larger issue, and we're going to get to it. And then Diener states that um, that the psych, <laughs> I kept using psych as well. I didn't, uh, psycho psychosis has obligation. There's an obligation. So Diener argues there's an obligation under patient confidentiality uh, between the patient and the doctor that for the exception if there's homicidal statements made. So that's the exception and kind of the meat of it all, right? Because, I mean, everything else is irrelevant. And then we do hear about that from Dean a little later. So then Gall says, I will, ma I will maintain the documents for offer of proof. And Rosie says, thank you. Now you can start about the personal knowledge of the case right. uh, following social media since 2017. Right. Which, you know, and, and this is, of course, probably, you know, why I like I perked up at this point because I was like, mm -hmm. okay, 3.28 yeah. p.m. Rosie says <laughs> you follow you follow the case on social media closely, correct? Um, Facebook, podcast, etc. Um, and he listed, I, he may have listed one or two other things. Um, and um, Walla's response was yes. Um, but not in 2017. Sa she said she stated not at that time, a couple years later. Right. Um, he's, he said, you, you actually even listened to Delphi podcast on your way to and from work. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. And Brad Rosie said, you, you actually went to Delphi. You went to the Monon high bridge. Um, Wallace said, yes. Which was one year um, before the arrest, by the way. Yes. Um, Rosie then said, would you, would you say it's fair to say you followed the close um, the case closer once Keegan Klein was mentioned. Yeah. Um, Wallace said, yes, I was interested mm -hmm. in that theory. Mm -hmm. um, Brad Rosie then said, you would it be fair to say you followed the case even closer after that once Richard Allen was arrested? Mm -hmm. She said, yes. Correct. Yep. Um, then Rosie says, and it, isn't it true you access Richard Allen's information on the program insight um which is their inner you know doc um wait did you mean keegan klein i have you access richard allen's um, information on insight and she said yes and then he okay. said you uh, and then he said you accessed keegan klein's info too correct okay and she said yes brad rosit says would you consider that to be improper Dr. Wallace said, probably. Um, um, Brad Rosie said, and were you disciplined for those those um, actions? Wallace said, no. We then have Exhibit W, which is a Facebook post made by Monica Walla, um, um, giving her podcast recommendations in a um, Facebook Delphi group. And then I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause and let you catch up if you have anything different. Um, really the only thing I had to add there was that she had been on Facebook in, and in certain forums and she agreed with that and she had significant knowledge and was very engaged with, with the case itself. And a few months ago is what she stated, um, that she had, there was a comment, um, after he was arrested um, regarding the rules of employment, but she'd not been disciplined, she'd not been talked to, and 
and he had already moved on to Wabash. And, th and then it was mentioned that Dr. Walla had visited Wabash after Alan was moved. And then you get Correct. into your exhibit W. Um, and that was when she gave her list of podcast mm -hmm. recommendations. Um, and for anyone that has, has seen that um, Facebook post, it made the rounds. Mm -hmm. Like um, back, you know, when, when um, I think people kind of, you know, said she was making social media posts about things. Um, that's the only one that they, that they, that's the only, um, mm. reference or post that they even mentioned or talked about in court. Um, and mm. I never saw any, I never mm. saw her, um, discuss the case on social media, um, about so, anything, about anything case related whatsoever. One but, thing I will say, Exhibit W was the podcast recommendations that she responded. And I have a notation here that her real name was used and it was a YouTube comment. And I just don't remember that as being, I remember it being Facebook related and I could be wrong there. But anyway, without objection, exhibit W was admitted for the, for the YouTube comment in her real name. And he said, you rendered a public opinion. And I have a notation here that Dr. Walla was smiling at Rosie during this mm -hmm. time. <laughs> and she went on to say that she talked to Richard Allen about the tone of his, of the social media and that he, quote, he had supporters. Well, yeah, well, he, Rosie asked her, Rosie said, Walla, oh, okay. uh, Ro Rosie said, Walla, you told, or Dr. Walla, you told Richard Allen, about social media stuff about the case, correct? Um, and she said, I told him that the tone of the case and I wanted him to know he had supporters out there. Um, Brad Rosie then um, presents Exhibit X, which is the ethical codes of psychology. Um, Walla points out that she does not believe that she violated any codes of ethics. Um, and when, uh, when asked, Again, she said, I'm going to go with not. Right. That was the so, quote I have. <laughs> so with regards to Exhibit X and the ethical principles of psychology, on page number three is principle B, as in Bob. And I, and I wrote down, it's reasonable to agree that your conduct on social media is a violation of those policies. And she states, I disagree. You vi and then Rosie says, you're violating Alan's privacy. And she say, states, I feel like this is a gray area. The psycho and then Rosie That's, states, yeah, the psychologist refrains from personal relationships. Um, and Rosie states, it's, it's reasonable that it would affect your ability to treat the patient. And Wallace states, I have to disagree with that. I was still trying to treat. I was not using stuff that I read about in my professional work. We don't treat what these inmates are convicted of. Right. There were no other major stories in the area. And then Rosie gets into 4.01, which is maintaining patient confidentiality. Correct. Um, then there's a mention of RDC psyche, um, psychologist, um, Dr. Criminal. Mm-hmm. Um, Pringle, I think. Maybe. Oh, Pringle, yes, Pringle? yes, yes, Pringle. Um, but I don't have, I don't have a note about why they mentioned him. Like at I have Doctor Free, I have Doctor Freebo, which is the she, and then Doctor Pringle in question marks. <laughs> it was, okay. it was difficult to hear, and they weren't spelling those out because they weren't witnesses. Um, right. And just in between and here, we, there was some sort of discussion again about uh, what she's supposed to do with all the papers, um, and they were discussing getting rid of her notes again. And there but must have been briefly because there was just like a little. I just had a little line, and then Rosie said, "Did you obtain private info?" and make records and then he i guess he referenced dr freebo or freeman and and in brackets i have she and then dr pringle question mark and walla responds i don't know what she said okay and then we are into exhibit y um and so and i think what the, you know i think he was referring back to when she was giving the the basis of how she normally would take her notes she would take notes she would then like you know transcribe them or and then um, just and then destroy them within 24, you know, she would put them into notes within 24 hours, but then she would 
give her, you know, that she would mm. throw them, she would shred, shred them, them basically. Yep. Um, and there was some, the back and forth was over her destroying the notes that she'd taken, um, you know, and, you know, so basically was she going off of her memory then when she would, would she, when she would put them into the file? Um, and I have a side note there where I said, so I guess now we can, we, it's safe to say that mental health notes are the gold standard, but police interview notes without videotaped, uh, videotaped <laughs> interviews are worthless pieces of trash. <laughs> As Sorry. Cute observation as always. <laughs> Sorry. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so uh, for exhibit Y, he wanted to know: Did you break it, the p patient confidentiality, by destroying the notes? And uh, she says, "I'm not as familiar with the records as much as I should be regarding personal notes." And and they were really kind of getting at. The back and forth there was was about these personal notes. And I'm not really, like, what, what was he really arguing? Was he trying to say that her handwritten notes should have been attached in some or kept? I think, he, I mean, basically, essentially, I think that's what I he was arguing, so. right? In right, other that words. they've been destroyed. Right. And in other and words, anybody could he, have entered it into the computer. Like, was that was kind well, of, was that what was kind of being alluded to? Or what was your take on that? Well, and they kept he, he they kept using the word destroyed, um, you know that you would destroy your notes. Um, um, it's strange, yeah, isn't it? Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not. I don't know what the normal procedure should be, or you know, even or even what they're allowed to do, you know, going in and out of the prison or whatever. Um, but. Um, I didn't really feel like he was questioning her ethics on that aspect of it. Oh, I think I he was just it. putting you it on the record. I, I, I felt like he was really just getting that, getting it on the record that, that, you know, that, that, that what the information they were going off of were not the immediate, um, oh. hmm. immediate. Um, oh, well, report. I definitely took it that way. And I kind of took it like anybody could have been putting those notes or made those notations in the computer. And if we don't have her handwritten notes, how do we know, you know, this kind of got all, gets back to the whole corruption thing to me. That's the way I took it. Well, um, he, but he, he didn't really question. He didn't, he didn't then quite, he didn't question anyone else's access to her. No, that's true. So true. that, that's why I really felt like he was just trying to kind of invalidate the information itself by being like, you know, how certain can you be that if you're just putting it into the report from notes that we don't have the actual original ones of anymore? Right. So, well, interestingly, Diener objects at this point, and mm -hmm. she states, you're trying to discredit Dr. Walla, but this motion is about suppressing statements that Alan made to Walla. Were they voluntary? Was there collusion? And regarding the confidentiality, again, all records for Alan's health are kept confidential except statements about homicide. It, was, it wasn't Walla's job. The baseline, everything for his mental health baseline is confidential. Right. Kind so of like in, when they were, in other words, irrelevant, really. Right. Kind of like when they were questioning about his rec time and, they, and she objected and, they, uh, and she was like, I don't. I don't think his mental health, um, you know, professional, you know, is really qualified to be talking about his, you know, rec time. Right. But, um, and she did state, Diener did, Stacey Diener did state, we did not know about his mental health until we got access. And of course they only got access because right. of the confessions. Well, and, well, and, well, and cause how many times did they request the, um, the mental health records? Was yeah. it two or three times yes. before before they got them? Yeah. Um, and I um I have the next thing I have for him is that he asked her, um, do you agree that it was wrong to post on social media? Did you have anything in between there? I do. I have um read after this argument made by Diener about um not knowing about Alan's mental health until they got access. I have Rosie quoting the 14th amendment and due process 
and being assigned a psychologist. And Diener objected, objected to that and said that the state um, the state's request for admissibility and Judge Gull overruled her and she said it is relevant. And then there was guidelines mentioned number four and number six, which I, I missed number four, but number six was protecting the records. And exhibit uh, Z is the APA guidelines. Um, so then we get into your activities on social media and there there gets a there's a breakdown here 2.1 um do you agree that your opinions on social media were improper she says yes rosie states you wouldn't do it again wallace states i wouldn't and then exhibit double a is entered which is the doc health care 4.03 a from april 1st of 2022 this directive follows how you treat offenders in restrictive housing, page 15. Special mental health services are, are available. And then they bring up the three prisons the, in Indiana that have those special mental health services. And they were uh, our New Newcastle, which seems to be the go-to um, for Westville, and then uh, Hamilton and Wabash and Westville isn't isn't even on those three specialized mental health services. Uh, I noticed and, that, yeah. Yeah. So 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 you got you you're, did you have all the different exhibits in between here cuz I it goes on from here. Um I have then at 401 Deaner begins her cross exam. So I guess that was just her her just following up um at the end of um, Rosie's, but her actual cross exam starts started at four oh one. Okay. So that so you know just just um, that portion of her being on the stand lasted for. Let's see, she went on the stand at one twenty. What do I have? Um, one twenty eight p.m. She went on the stand. So I mean. 401 is just then when um, her Diener is, cro is starting her cross exam. And she goes on for another, she continues on with her testimony for an, another hour and a half. Yeah. And yeah. I just she... want to state at this point that Dr. Walla was on the stand for four hours and there wasn't one time that I noticed her being uncomfortable. She wasn't phased. She, as you said, was uh, professional and, she had that human connection. She, you could tell that she cared. She certainly cared about her client, Alan. Right. And she made all. She made a lot of contact with him. with With her eyes, she looked and smiled at right. him frequently. I think we all pr probably right. picked up on that. And she was very engaged. And I didn't find. At any point, certainly up until 4 p.m., like I didn't notice her uncomfortable in any way at all. Did you? Uh, no, I mean, of course, that's going to be, you know, that's going to be subjective, depending, you know, you know, it's an, an opinion, of course, but um, I did not. I mean, even when she was conceding th to things that, right, that, that she, um, I felt like she was honest. I, I appreciated that, you know, when she, you know, kind of in, talked about some of the in, imperfect um, parts of, of the program that she's, you know, very intimately, um, you know, well, yeah. that her that her career is kind of based in. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, we still have, like I said, more testimony testimony mm -hmm. by her to go. Um, but I didn't feel like she's. I didn't feel like she came off as very nervous or, um, no. or, you know, I think the only question that people, you know, the only question that could um, come into play is, you know, you know, all of the all of the care she showed for Rich Allen, you know, because of some of the actions she took, can then her um, mm. intentions behind that care, you know, well, I don't know, those, I, that's, I don't want to put my opinions into it. Um, I just thought it was very interesting when she talked about how, how she could compartmentalize her, mm. her, her true crime entertainment, um, which was hard to hear those were, you know, when I, when, when the, the victim's families are all sitting there and, you know, and, yeah. and, and I can't remember which attorney used the word, you know, mm. true, true crime entertainment or something. Yeah, it was. But, rude. um, and I, I don't think he meant anything by it, but, um, yeah, the commute 1.5 hours each way, several times but, a week for personal entertainment. 
but yeah, the, yeah and, and that she could compartmentalize the that from then her from her um, professional um, bases and opinion or opinions on him. So um, we're, I, no, I, I found just her wanted, very yeah. I, I found her very um, like I said I I found her very connected mm -hmm. or easy to connect to and warm um, and caring and genuine, but. And um, I found it I very interesting, um, just my, this is just my opinion, that originally when we heard um, that she had been participating in, in the Delphi groups and on and, and all these you know different forums and we weren't certain if it was her, I wasn't certain if it was her or somebody pretending to be her and, and all of this, um, it kind of, it was, it was, it was, you know, a lot of a lot of the defense supporters that had been, you know, l really looking at her, like they mm. kind of seemed to have an inclination of, you know, what had gone on with her. And it was found out very quickly, regardless oh. of when, when her, her, when her name come out in the filing around May 8th, I think it was with, with uh, the prosecution, but it was interesting because it, it seemed like she was being portrayed by people in the public, uh, sphere as being, you know, really uh, doing things inappropriately online in um, against Alan or, you know, doing like, something manipulative. But in the end, as we're gonna about to find out the more specific details of, she was actually supporting him in his, in her, you know, when she did give him words of encouragement from what she had seen online, she was she was using anything that she was reading or, or participating in up until that point. It seems that she, you know, was encouraging him and trying to make him feel better, and not the other way around. So it was quite a. It was her her testimony was quite compelling for this right. reason because it seemed conflicting with what you thought you were going to hear, and it just well, and I think to your point about Rosie and his tone and switching and everything, it was it was tricky, and he did do a good job at that because things didn't exactly go. I don't think they went the way they thought it was going to with her when they got into the the meat of it with her reports and how she had talk to Alan with respect to what she knew or, you know, had done on, on social media. So it was, it was interesting for me. And that's just, you know, my just personal take on how I was interpreting what was going on that of day course. with, with well, Dr. Walla. It's, good, it's a good example of what, you know, when, you know, well, no, no one should, you know, curate, curate their um, opinions based on the mm. side they think they want to be on or, you know, right. whatever, but yeah. Um, but um, I think, you know, the factual part of it is that it doesn't really matter if she supported Richard Allen or not. It's just, are the actions that she took w worthy of her, um, her testimony being admissible in court or not? Yeah. Um, and that's what we'll, we're waiting to find out. Right. So we, we get to, um, yep. so we get to the, um, the cross mm -hmm. by Diener and, um, I found this to be a very, I'm sorry, do you have something to say you want there? I'm just not sure where you're going to, you're going to pick up on Diener here. So I just wanted to say that at 4 p.m., Rosie states that the 30-day threshold uh, for, uh, he must have been bringing back up the, the segregation unit again or, or suicide mm -hmm. watch is really in place because of serious uh, mental illness and the only reason that the DOC is not subject to that is because Richard Allen is a quote safekeeper and Wallace states that is what I was told. And then, okay. um, so then we get into the stressors pertaining to confinement that cause well, confession. Yeah. Keep going. Um, there was April tw of 2022 policies regarding suicide operations um, for behavioral health that would appear in quotations if she quoted him. Um, so then, then it gets, this is back to her notes, and this is Diener who brings that up. Yes. Um, and this destroying of the notes, and, Dean, and Wallace states that she didn't want her notes floating around. 
There were electronic right. medical records only. And then there was a consent for treatment and confinement, I believe, by Dr. Primbrew. Primp Pru. Is that what I right. that so that that's who I had written down a little bit okay. ago. Prim Pru. Good, good. Okay. And then Diener asked her, would there be a document, the name, the date, without a signature? And Dr. Wallace says, can I see it? And then Diener enters exhibit number nine, which is Dr. Kumo from the RDOC. So we're going back to the original when he was arrested. There's a paper chart from November 8th of 2022. And that was the date uh, that I talked to him about it. So she's quote, she must be quoting from the binder from the reports. Okay. And then November 10th of 2022, which was exhibit 10 is your report. And the first two paragraphs are, um, you don't need to know about his case to treat him. Correct. Diener asks, and she says, correct. And at this point, I noticed that OJ was, this is when OJ starts speaking to Alan and I think this is right. when this might no I, the notes I definitely she they did end up passing notes but that doesn't come till later right because remember Diener, Baldwin's not there right uh, yeah yeah so so Diener states early on uh, she's reading from Wallace's report here early on he made the best of the ADL he had uh, ADL stands for the activities of daily living so right. he was brushing his teeth he was keeping clean. Someone was stopping by and seeing him twice a day. Um, he had, you know, daily visits because he was on suicide watch. And uh, and that's what was happening, I guess. If he, if he was not on suicide watch, it was at least weekly. From right. December 2022 until April 2023, Richard Allen was not on suicide watch. Right. He was in a safe he was in a sa the safest cell they had as opposed to general population, but he was not on a suicide watch. Right. Which we already talked about as yep. far as they talked about it again. It was brought up. Yeah. Yep. And then November third of twenty twenty two, Dr. Kumo at the RDOC uh, RDC, sorry, she provided the orders. Um and then she arrived and with with those orders and because of his high profile, they implemented uh, the constant suicide watch. Correct. Um, I found and this is some this is a part that I thought I think a lot of people probably skipped right over. Um, I found it to be actually very, very interesting. Um, but, but there was just a general question asked to Dr. Walla about you know what types of things about Richard Allen and his background would they discuss what you know would Walla and and Allen discuss and um, the um, the list that Walla said is you know she said he would talk about how he was married how he has a daughter that he works at CBS um, she said he was very proud of the fact that um, he owned his own house and that he um, he considers himself to make very good financial decisions. Um, he was proud of the fact that he owns two vehicles. Um, um, and, and then I have a notation that when they go in through his whole background, there's never a mention, and we know he was in the National Guard, the, mm. the, timing, the timing of how long he was in has been, has been disputed. Um, but I found it interesting that when going through all of those things, there was not a single mention of any military service or or his time in the in the National yeah. Guard, and presumably, of course, just my opinion, if someone's in the in a military uh, situation for ten years of their life, you, you would it would there would at least be a mention of it, and there hasn't been. Strange, so I'm I'm it's curious about the app. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's. I mean, you're proud. Bit... You're, you're proud to have two cars, but you don't mention the fact you, you know, held a yeah. service, some sort of service job for a long time. But that, that was just a notation I had. Um, doesn't mean doesn't mean anything. But Excellent. I found the, yep. the I found the good financial decision things um, interesting, and how and how he would mention how proud he was that he owned his ha his home outright. Um, 
the ISP forensics wanted to talk to Walla, and this references back to something we talked about earlier today when she had that request from the name, I can't remember the name, but, um, um, and then it not so, Richard, yeah, sorry, Richard Allen said no. And so she did it and then nothing came of it. Um, but did you have something? I had one thing after you, um, what he discussed about his personal life. Diener asked, um, she said he, ha uh, Alan had problems with inmate companions. Uh, did you know what they said? And Dr. Waller responded, not necessarily. Uh, that was, uh, the officers, uh, were outside of, of her control. And then there was something asked about, did you ever see them engage, uh, referring to the officers at this point. And she said that she would see them delivering a food tray. So she really right. didn't have a lot of, you know, it was just a, a, a cursory, I guess a cursory observations of, of the officers and, and, and the inmate companions. Um, and then Diener asked, uh, there was someone from ISP that wanted to talk to Alan or you? And that's what and, I was referencing. Which yeah. And Wallace that, you know, said, was, I think to me is what she said. Right. So the reference earlier was when there was a request to, um, and she gave it, she left it up to Richard Allen to decide. He said no. And this is where we, where we find out that it not it wasn't necessarily to interview Richard Allen. The request with them in Wallace's yeah. um, summation was that the request was to interview her. Yep. Yep. And Wallace said, it's obviously still inappropriate. And Diener asked, and you didn't do it? And Wallace said, no. Correct. So um, then and we then, get into the cage discussion. Yeah, I'll let you talk about that. So he was out of his cell uh, in a cubicle or, quote, cage room. It was triangular and there were stools close together with a table um and it was not the same as at wabash um which was a freestanding unit and dr wallace stated that she had never seen one like that before um right. when and then she said when i was treating him at wabash so they must have and it didn't they didn't get it clarified but she but that's what my notes say that when I was treating him at Wabash so she must have I well, mean we had what... heard this testimony about how she could go to the different facilities right. and I think I think it's safe to assume that everything that had gone on between them at Westville, that when they did move them to Wabash, that they did probably transitionally, I'm just going to, I'm going to guess here, it wasn't testified about, but I think that they might have transitionally moved her over to patient care at Wabash. Or she might have at least gone over to facilitate the, the intake for the, right. for, for the yeah. mental health team there. Because, um, yeah. you know, we'd already, know, we'd already learned about the fact that, you know, the therapeutic three by three triangular cage as she referred to it um in um westville was different than the freestanding um mm -hmm. four-sided um um therapeutic cage that they had in wabash but that that one is actually even smaller um and so yeah i believe that she did go like you know it said for it said for his care but my assumption was just that it was probably to transition him to whatever um equivalent to whatever the lead psychologist was at the Wabash facility. Because yeah. there was no mention of her visiting him after that. So I don't, I don't believe that, you know, I don't believe that, you know, she, he's not still her help, you know, she's still not his. Um, right. Caregiver. You, yeah. 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 So Diener asked at 423 uh, if she had psych psychological certifications and license for the state of Indiana, which she agreed. And then Diener asked before April, before he got his legal docs at his baseline, uh, was he good? He was a right. bit, and Walla testified that he was a bit down because he was incarcerated, but he was eating, he was taking his medication. He was taking care of himself. He was exercising and he was reading. And then 
Diener states, on April 3rd or 4th, 2023, yes. Richard Allen received legal dogs, a large volume. And Dr. Wallace stated, that's what I was told. And she says, on April 4th, his circumstances changed significantly, correct? And Dr. Waller responded, correct. I made notes that he was presenting bizarrely. His speech and thought patterns were disorganized, and he changed. He had a change in his presentation. He had just had two visits with his attorneys, and we believed on site that it was a major event that had happened prior to his change in behavior, resulting in him going back on suicide watch. Correct. And that's when, if, if any people remember, April 3rd, I believe, or the 4th is the day that, um, is the day that the, the picture of him with a stain on his jumpsuit was taken. Is it May, is it May 3rd a or April? April, April. Okay. Um, hmm. because I think it was when they brought oh, him back. Be. Yeah. When they, because I, it was taken when they brought him hit, um, the legal, um, documents. Um, and then that, and then that picture was, was used later. And I was at a hearing in May or June, but it, but it was taken on April 3rd or 4th. Um, I have April 4th, um, is the date that he started to confess to other staff and companions. Yep. So he, you know, apparently already had made, um, statements, but that's when he started confessing to other staff and companions. Um, Walla attributed the change to the documents he received and the two recent vid visits he'd had with attorneys um, Baldwin and Rosie. After April 4th, and this is this was a point where I think everyone's head in the courtroom popped mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. because um, it was said in quotations, <laughs> Richard Allen said, I found mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. I, fa I found God. Um, <laughs> yeah. He init initially upon his arrival at Westville, Set, had said he was not very religious, um, but that on March 21st of 2023, um, Richard Allen says he took God into his heart. Um, he brought God into some of his confessions, um, meant, referring to and mentioning the Bible, not specific, though, as to what they, what they were, what, what he said, um, but that his mood would range from laughing to sad, um, and Walla again notes that she was not certain if it was, if it was genuine, um, if he was being genuine about the changes and the claims of memory lapse says Alan at the time was sitting in the courtroom, nodding. Yes. I haven't, I noted, um, on April 7th, he inquired what he was confessing to. So you have just, anything different about that? Yep. So I'll just bring up to, I'll bring you up on my notes that I took. Those were excellent notes that you have there. Um, I had a, a, just a couple things to add to that. Uh, on April 5th of 2023, the last change in his status, which was the first paragraph in Dr. Wallace's report, uh, Alan made very specific statements of, of the charges in the, in his case. And, and Walla, Walla would said she would she would just start talking to him and say, "How are you doing? What's going on?" And then see where Alan would go. She stated that she did not ask him about the crime, and and he made references to the crimes, and and then he talked about what he wanted to do with his life. And on page four and five. Um, Anxiety and depression significantly improved. The patient symptoms report appears up reports appear questionable. So, so she, so we're into page four. So she made a lot of notations, um, and I'm just not sure on exactly. It seems to me that that I mean I have the March 21st um, date of, of of Alan saying that he took God into his heart, and then the the references to this. Um, anxiety and depression significantly improving but she, but she was doubting it um because he would go from crying to smiling he he mentioned that he had memory lapses he had um 
So she had made the notation, and I quote, patient symptoms uh, report appears questionable. And and when he's behaving bizarrely, uh, your patient symptom report, you, you refer to it as, quote, faking symptoms. And Alan is nodding yes in agreement with Walla when she's testifying about all yes. of this. And um, she said, Dr. Walla stated that the psychotic symptoms were not clear. There was two kinds. There were symptoms where... It, um, it was not clear, and she and she thought he was faking. And then there were symptoms, psychotic symptoms, where it was clear, you know, right. that he wasn't faking. So that was kind of broken out in two prongs there. And then you get into your April seventh. Sorry, well, yeah, I and a few no, things there. Oh no, yeah, you're fine because yeah, I mean, we had the same thing basically as far as you know that he was he was nodding yes in agreement with yep. all of the, the whole time she was talking yes, about. Yes, he that. was. Um, yeah. He actually nodded a lot in court. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he would respond to things. Um, yep. um, um, and especially in his body, um, in his, in, you know, in his body language. Mm -hmm. um, so April 7th, I have that he, he had inquired what he was confessing to. And at that point, Walla advised him against continuing to do so. Um, and she also noted that he was still, that he was faking the behavior. Yeah, increasingly um, purposefully displaying psychotic behavior, yes. faking. Like, um, on April 12th, 2023, um, he refused to go to, to, go to rec um, when offered. Um, it was never withheld from him, but that he would refuse sometimes. Um, she then mentions for the third time um, that, she, that she has doubts if if all of this is genuine and real. Um, that's when they, that's when it's brought up that it, the injections he's been get that he starts getting are how it all. Um, and then he's also given an oral had it all for sleep. Um, he, um, and then he, he would, he would, he slept for days. They said, um, he would take Prozac for depression. And I, the next thing I have is Dr. Martin would come one, like once a week because he was the prescribing doctor. So just um, he, before you continue on there, I'll I, just add a couple of things if I could. Because yeah, I know so, you're, on, you're on my next page. So I'm just going to, okay. before I flip here, I just wanted to say that um, with respect to April 12th, 2023 and, ref and him refusing to go to REC, Diener states that even on that day, you weren't certain if it was psychosis. And around the time he received, he received involuntary injection, Dr. Martin was there. Uh, they removed him from his cell to take him to another area. And he was making statements about the crime. And, he, and Alan did not want med medication. Um, and Dr. Walla testified that... The Halidol meds were almost always uh, used if he wasn't sleeping much. He would get another order for the injection. And there were definitely days when he was not engaging. She stated that he may have been over-medicated. Uh, he didn't have much to say. And, uh, he, and Diener states that he slept for two days. If, if he declined speaking, you thought it could have come from the Halidol? And she said, yeah, uh, sometimes... He was just laying there, and I don't know how they would distinguish between sleeping and laying. And then the pro, and then you had your Prozac um, being received, and and Diener asked about any significant changes in the medications, and and Walla did state that the Halidol was gi being given because he wasn't sleeping. It's possible that he refused the medication some days. And Dr. Martin came to our site once a week. And Diener asked if they would consult about Alan. And she stated, Wallace stated that they had team meetings with Dr. Martin. And um, they were attended, he, he attended because he prescribed Alan's medications. They discussed Alan specifically when he wasn't sleeping. And eventually he improved and he was taken off the Halidol pretty quickly. And I quote her there. And she, yeah, did, I... she did say one very important thing for me at this point. She said specifically, 
he wanted to control his circumstances and right. get healthier, but he didn't, he didn't miss more than four meals or he would be reported. So he oh. still had that, you know, he was, he, you know, he was, he was cognitively functioning and control. He wanted to control things, which I, which I thought was interesting. Um, yeah. So the, the point you just mentioned is probably one of the, probably one of the most um, sig significant things I found interesting mm. over the whole, over the course of, of the, of three days. And again, I'm not a mental health professional, um, but I found um, that statement to be incredibly um, um, interesting to me um, as far as like insight into his personality. Yep. Um, yep. So I have that, you know, that, yeah, he, he did improve on the had it, had it, had it all. Um, and then he was taken off the injections pretty quickly. Um, w the reason that the control his circumstances was brought up is because as an example, Walla said that he would, um, at times he would skip meals, um, but never more than four in a row because after four in a four in a row, they track it. Um, and when he, she asked him why he would do this, he said it was to control his circumstances. Um, and again, like, and that was kind of like, I have a three stars by it. Yeah, because so do I. Because I was like, um, <laughs> well, I was like, wow. We're going I mean, back to the new direction presser but, is what we're doing. Well, no, I mean. <laughs> That's what I was doing. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I'll I mean, be honest. If I'm in a situation where, I mean, I mean, I just know me personally, if I'm in a situation where I, I feel like I have a little control over certain things, it makes me, it makes me, um, feel better. Well, no, it makes, no, it makes me cling on to the things that I can control mm -hmm. and actually probably try to control them even more. Yeah. That's just, that's just my personality. Um, and so I could identify with that, um, that with that statement. Um, I have on May 2nd, 2023, um, that he, that she quoted, she's quoted as saying, he had a lot to say that day. Yes. And and that was profound when she said that because Diener had approached her with that report. And yes. she ha she handed it to Dr. Wallace so that she could remember. And she looked at it and she said, yeah, he had a lot to say that day. Like she knew right away, like, here we go. Because, of course, um, we get into it. You want it? You want to go on? Well, do you have the quote? Do you have the full quote that he that he made mm -hmm. at that point about I do, about? I do. Okay, yeah, you can read it because I only got the I'm too much of a coward to. Okay, no, I have it. Okay, so Dr. Walla testified that on May second, twenty twenty three, that Richard Allen had a lot to say that day. Uh, he wanted to know why he shouldn't kill himself. Um. And, and and other incarcerated inmates were trying to get to either, you know, kill him or get him to commit suicide, trying to get him to kill himself. And Alan was saying, should I kill myself? Um, he, I had something about climbing up on something there, but <laughs> I just don't know what I no, don't have. Yeah, there was a reference. He did say there was something about him climbing to the top of something and. Oh, or was that, or was that the thing about the basketball thing goal? No, in the rec yard. All right, no, never mind then. So he stated, and 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 this is from Walla's report for the second, and, and from Walla's testimony. Actually, she's speaking, and she said, "I think uh, I, I I've killed my family, I've killed my best friends, but I won't kill myself because I'm too much of a coward." Correct. And, and of course, that was the jaw dropping moment, right? And well, and of course, we know it got spun out of context about killing his family. But what he was getting at, of course, was that he's ruined everybody's lives. But mm -hmm. he fully stated, and again, I got to bring up Superintendent Carter at the New Direction because you know he you know he called he called him a coward, and there he is saying, "I'm too much of a coward. I'm not right. going to kill myself." Right. Well. Yeah, and, and I'll be honest, that was probably one of the very first questions, like, w while we were there for the hearings, you know, because um, mm -hmm. I wasn't paying attention to anything that people were reporting, really. Um, no. And, um, and I, you know, was not good at checking my messages daily. 
Um, but I, that was one of the first thing I had messages from people yeah. asking for clarification mm -hmm. on that because yeah. I guess some people were hearing that Richard mm -hmm. Allen made a statement about killing his family yeah. Yeah. and they, I think were, were connecting it to his then confessions. Um, but, but when you put it into the context of what, of how it was said and who it was said to, it makes much more just logical mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. That, I put that fire out too. We both did. We were both getting in, inundated. The same thing happened to me. I was getting requests for clarification. I'm like, who, where is that coming from? That right. is not what was, but of course, and you it, know, we were overloaded. But I found with, that to be a very sincere, um, I, but I found that yes. to be a very sincere statement to say, you yes. know, to, to acknowledge that, you know, that all of this, hold on. The, all of this and the effect it's had, you know, had is, you know, ruined your family. It's ruined your friends. Um, and that, you know, and some people just, you know, do look, do look at life that way that, you know, that they wish they could do something to themselves, but they just can't. Um, I, anyway, I, um, that's all I have for May 2nd. So I have on May 2nd at 3 p.m., there was a notation and Stacy Diener enters it as exhibit number 15. And uh, there's a notation that at 3 p.m. on May 2nd, the entry was made that the psychosis appears to have disappeared. And then there was, uh, now I have this written down and I don't remember the context at all, but it says collective conclusion question mark and Wallace states yes and then we're into May 3rd which is exhibit number 16 right so on May 3rd 2023 um Walla during her daily visit um um Richard Allen stated to her that he wanted to call um Kathy um and I don't know if this was during the time that his tablet was broken or um but for whatever reason um, he, he had requested Wallace help in getting him a phone to, to use. And, um, it I, was, my was it and, like it was broken. Yes. And my understanding is that, um, is that there are wall mounted phones, like for people in gen pop and things like that, that, you know, everyone's tablets are capable of making calls and texts. Um, but that there is in every blo cell block or whatever, um, a cordless telephone. Um, and so she went and got the cordless telephone and brought it back to him, but Kathy didn't answer. Um, I would say, oh yeah, I do have, it was during that time that, was, that he had broken his tablet. It had been, and they said it was replaced within a week. Um, so I just had that there for context of when his tablet was broken and when it wasn't. Um, Walla had been clear that it wasn't smart for him to talk about his crimes. He continued to do so with details um, he seemed more organized than ever in his thoughts, to be honest, but then would act um, very confused about whether Easter had come or was still to come, um, if it had happened or, or, or if it had happened or not yet. Do you have anything else between there? Um, she did say that he was more organized than he yes. had been in his thinking. And... I know that this is an issue because I, I, I've i seen all these things being said about the cordless phone and recordings and this and that. And we'd already heard the testimony um, and things stated by the defense regarding um, that there was a lot of hammering down about these uh, the phones, how they're recorded. And I think this cordless phone thing comes into play here because the cordless phones are monitored um for the for the doc differently than the gtl system that's used for calls that are made Correct. so i yeah so i just wanted to get into saying that when she assisted she found the cordless phone she assisted uh, so, she, so she actually had to look up the number yeah, he, for he the approved number, number list Right. And he had to, she had to help. Uh, and, you know, she determined because that number was on his approved list. And, and I do wonder if this is pertaining to also about the recordings, because would, would a DOC, and this is just a question I have, would it, would a DOC recording on a cordless phone flag as soon as the inmates number is dialed? Because that, number is tied in specifically in their system as being 
you know, it's not his attorney and he's calling and so therefore it should be recorded. That's the question I have well, on that. And she assisted in dialing him. Dialing my, him. My, my information on that would be just that um, they run, they, they are two different systems and they're both run by third party companies. Um, and so, you know, the majority of your communication, of course, if you have a tablet is going to be through, through the tablet um, we found, we also know that, um, according to Jerry Holman, they weren't like, you know, they weren't actively, you know, looking at every text and call he made, um, and going through them in real time at that point. And it wasn't until he began making the confessions, um, to his family that they did start monitoring them and like, like reading everything and watching all of the, you know, all of listening to all of the recorded calls and transcriptions. Um, and so it would make sense to me that of course, there's, because there's so much less content on that, on that system that the cordless phone used, it was much easier to pick that out, you know, when it was being, when they looked overlooked, you know, when they looked into it. Um, but again, that's just my take from it too, but either we, uh, you know, factually, we know she used the cordless phone. And, um, and this is important to note. Uh, there were because this has been really con people do not understand that there were two separate days that Walla yeah, we'll was there. That. Yeah, so May third, what we just talked about with the cordless phone and and calling, Kathy didn't answer and he did not right. talk to her. Now he my notes continuing on from this for May third are that. Alan was struggling and confessing. He wanted to go to the Newcastle Hospital, mm -hmm. and Dr. Walla told him to talk to his attorney. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it was during that time that, yes, he asked for a transfer to a mental health. Um, he was, yeah, he, he apparently was requesting that he wanted to be, men to, wanted to be transferred to a mental health. Um, and she questioned whether his motive here if that if that was his motive to acting the way he had been, hmm. um, and that that's what I have that leads us up to May tenth. Good. So on May tenth, um, which is you know one week to the date after the last um, the well the last cordless phone um, thing, um, Walla once again was um, asked by Richard Allen. Um, to help him call Kathy, which I guess he didn't have his tablet back yet, even though we heard it was returned with a week within a week. That's a week later, and he didn't have it back yet. I guess. Um, Walla, Can I just say uh, one thing on that? I know you no. said about we a week later, but for some reason, when they were discussing the May third, it was stated that he got the tablet on the very last day before he went to Wabash. There was confusion that, that comes later, and there was confusion. Okay, okay. There was there was confusion over that because the time that we heard that he broke, there's we heard he may have possibly broken two tablets. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. But we know for certain about the one. And I don't want to speculate on something we mm. don't have. But but that but there was mention of mm -hmm. of him his tablet being returned the last day he was at um, at West uh, Westville. But the but for the majority of people's testimony, it's. You know, he had his, he had a tablet almost the entire time he was at yeah. um, Westville because yeah. that's where the majority of the communications yeah. lie. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, so, you know, so we know that, you know, he broke the tablet sometime around May 3rd, did not have it back May 10th. Maybe he got it later that day. I don't know. Um, either way, Walla once again helped facilitate the phone call on the cordless phone again. You broke uh, down cordless phone because I didn't have that. Yes. Okay. Um, which is why he needed Wallace's help. Um, cause he couldn't go out, you know, he, he wouldn't have been allowed to go out to the wall mounted ones. So if he, he wouldn't have needed her help with, with, um, if he had his tablet, um, and he, so he wouldn't have needed her assistance unless it was a cordless phone. Um, she did not answer. Um, or no, he, he talked to her. Um, and then after hung, after they hung up, he asked, Walla if they could call Kathy back and he told Walla that he wanted to confess to Kathy but that he wanted Walla to hear 
so, so that yeah. so that she could understand why he did it. And and so it's important to note here that Doctor Walla left the room the for the yes. first time, and then when she came back. Alan said he said what you just said that he wanted to call her back and that he wanted Dr. Walla to hear it when he made the statements. Yeah. And the reason the reason is so that he so that she could understand why he did it. Um it, and that Kathy did not believe him. Yeah. Um I looked over at this point in court mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and and I noticed that um mm-hmm. Kathy was Kathy was nodding and crying. Um, which it was hard not it was hard not to want to like console her. Um, but she Richard was, Allen, yeah. But Richard Allen then says, "I can't choose God over my family." Yeah. And and I did the same thing as you, and I did it s- several times during this testimony because yeah. it was obviously very. And it so very, it would have been very hard to be Kathy Allen sitting there listening to that. Yeah. So, and, and Kathy had her head down. She was staring down for a very long time. She was nodding her head in agreement. She, ha- she was doing a little bit of rocking motion in her chair, just slightly. Wow. And like to comfort herself, she's nodding in agreement. She, o- she, she would open up her eyes and then she would close them back up. Like she'd look up briefly and then close them again and put her head down. And she was, she was rocking. She was definitely like co- trying to comfort herself for this and I, definitely in agreement of what happened here I, I would from, from her, it, from her, you know, from her behavior. I would assume it's not a, um, not a day she wants to, you know, relive. So mm-hmm. I can, I, I can understand. Um, I have that, you know, um, let's see, um, during, okay. So throughout the, throughout, um, Wallace care of Richard Allen, um, sh- she herself, um, heard conf- him confess to Kathy. She heard him confess to Dr. Martin and mm-hmm. she heard him confess during movements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was a period of time when he was confessing to many people. Right. He, she state, uh, Diener stated from the report that finding God is helping him deal with it and comforting him. And I have a big, huge quote here, starred a million times. I want to make things right, right by, by being, being honest. honest. Yeah, I have the same one. No doubt. Uh, <laughs> uh, Diener says... Um, to um, Walla, did you ever post about the facts of the case on social media? Um, Walla said no. Oh, which, by the way, I do want to mention um, in her list of favorite um, YouTubers and podcasts, um, I did not make her list. <laughs> so I just, I just, I did note it. I they didn't read out the list in court, yeah. but but I um I, I didn't I didn't mention it when I saw her outside the courthouse later that day. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so she said no um, at 5.17 p.m. So at this point, we've been in court for a full eight hours. Um, Rosie goes on his redirect. Um, and he had an even more aggressive tone, I thought, um, in the way that he was, which was intentional, you could tell, um, because of the, he said it was wrong, correct? Um, Wallace said, Following a case does not affect how I treat a, p- a patient. Um, Walla mentions a few things. Um, Walla mentioned a few things to Richard Allen about social media she felt would be helpful to his care. Um, she then brought up the fact that she told him someone had made a YouTube video saying, yeah, this guy is here. And Walla didn't want Richard Allen releasing Discovery during um, the time that he had had access to it once it was given to him. Yeah. Um, so somebody so, was in, and, in jail. So, so, and I, and, and so I guess whatever video they were referencing was on YouTube and that there was someone basically making the, you know, they were alleging that they're, yeah. that they basically have, you know, a track to, to Alan. Um, so I'll, if I could just halt, oh, you continue on, and then I just want well, to run was, clean up there when, what I had. Yeah, I was just going to say, and um, I have just on a quotation on here, I said, because um, 
can, someone tapped me on the shoulder and like and asked me if it was someone and I can't remember who, who did that. But um, and I looked back, I remember it at the murder sheet who were behind me, behind us, um, and they kind of looked this little. They kind of looked at, like same expression on their face, like, huh? Um, WTF? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what video they were referencing, but I'm I'm sure someone that that see, sees this will know and will and will let us yeah. know. <laughs> And we'll send it to us. No. Um, um. <laughs> so uh, if I could just, uh, there was a few things that I had there. Um, if I could. Absolutely. Okay. Um, you lost your icon. You lost your avatar there, uh, Aspen. I'm not sure if, if you changed something. Um, so, so he had stated that he wanted to make things right by being honest uh, Stacy Diener asked, is entering your notes the best way to keep your record safe? And Dr. Wallace said, I think so, but I'm going to take a look into this. Um, so they, there was more discussion about her taking her written notes and inputting them. Um, and she made a statement that she would still check on him and that, and that like on him and, and social media channels, she would watch on YouTube and she agreed with that. And then she was asked about um, if she released any facts about Alan and she stated no. And this is on cross from Rosie and she, and Rosie said, you should not have been following this case while you were uh, treating him. And she said, well, I don't know. I separate personal from, from professional. Um, and then there was discussion about notes being given to internal affairs. Right. And how often did you get the long notes, which were the guard sheets? Um, and then there was a suicide watch, medical records, administrative watch uh, went to the team manager. And then Rosie asked, did, War did Warden Gallipo ever get ask you to get him records? And she testified no. So that was kind of... I remember thinking, huh, where's he going with this? Uh, and anyway, then he, he enters, Rosie enters in Exhibit 9, um, discussing uh, compromising his safety and other, peop other people, uh, they were shouting at him and calling him a baby killer. And then he made a, a notation about medical records being electronic. And they were again in the discussion about um, um, the medical or the her uh, process of of note taking and putting them in the system, and that's and she says that's not how we were doing it, and it's a it's in our terms of process. And then she said, and I have the big WTF here, and <laughs> it's highlighted, and, and you'd already mentioned it, but she, but Dr. Wallace said that I mentioned a couple of things to Alan. I mentioned. Uh, the things that were mentioned on social media about him. And I just have WTF because she was telling Alan about things that people that support him and think he's innocent were saying. And so that was, so then Rosie goes into, and, and I think I'm caught up here, but he, he asks her about the silence of the lambs. And he says, did the cage remind you of her the response. cage? For the silence of the lambs, and you go ahead. <laughs> so, but before that, really quickly, you know, um, I found it interesting though when you know, she, you know, clearly not only you know she was concerned, um, not only about, of course, you know, like him feeling, she wanted him to feel like he had supporters out there, but she clearly, for some reason, also had a concern that, that you know, with the confessions and with the other things he was doing, you know, if if he is going to be telling people things that are from the discovery of his case, um, you know, she wanted him to be aware of the fact that like, there was this YouTube video of this guy saying, that, you know, Hey, the guy is here. Um, so, I mean, it looks like she had his best interest at heart right. with her actions. Yep. I yep. will say, um, I did love when Brad Rosie made the mention of silence of the lambs Yeah, and, and Dr. There's Walla, who, there's like a, there wasn't a groan in the courtroom, but I, I think I, in all of her heads, there was, well, most of her heads. Well, it's hard not to imagine that when you see a picture of one of those cages. I mean, I, I understand, but but to, to, yeah, to, I don't know how old um, Dr. Walla is, but when Dr. Walla responds to him, it yeah. was, 
um, I don't remember that film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, me, and we had immediate it, objection by Diener. It, it made me feel old because I was like, oh, <laughs> well, if, oh, come if, on. If you don't remember Silence of the Lambs, it's clearly because you probably weren't around. <laughs> um, and then, I don't know. It's like, has everybody heard of that movie? <laughs> I mean, especially if you're a true crime fan and you like psychology. No. Yeah, come <laughs> on. Yeah. Good come point. on, Dr. Walt. But then again, you know, her taste in, in YouTube and, and podcast <laughs> was different than mine, too. So, no kidding. <laughs> oh, good point. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing with that. Oh, um, yeah, that's so, funny. So, we really are about done. I have that. Um, it was brought up again about the hat at all. Uh, ha- was used as a tranquilizer to control... Um, um, to, when he was beating his head into the wall and door, um, and 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 eating feces. Um, and at that point, I looked. I looked and saw that Alan turned his head down and looked upset as he kind of nodded to, to, um, de- towards looking down, which I'm sure you know would would sound would feel humiliating to have people in a, a whole room of people hear you say that. Or hear that about you, you know, whatever. Right. So in the yeah, and so if I'll just I'll just add a few things here that I had as well to, to come up. Yeah, uh, you Rose, take us. You can take it home. <laughs> oh, can I? Okay, because I have some I have some good observations at the end. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you do too. No, um, it's, it's honestly that's about all I have. I have a few more little things, but that's about it. Okay. So Rosie stated in the weeks before. Uh, Alan got the discovery, um, and he referenced um, Exhibit 11 and 12, which were in reference to April 4th and April 5th of 2023. Um, There were activities that had occurred. There was brief psychotic episodes on and off over a period of time. And Dr. Wallace stated that it would probably be a different diagnosis. And then Rosie gets into June with the Halidol and basically says it's basically a tranquilizer, right? And she said sometimes it helps calm him down. When he was deteriorating, he would have no communication and no sleep. And then I quote, he was literally beating his head against the wall. He was running and smashing his head. His entire face and head was completely bruised. He was eating feces, and that is why he got the halidol. And and to your point, at this point, I looked up as well, and and Alan was very embarrassed and upset by this testimony. And Walla and I had a note that Dr. Walla had been looking at Alan, and she was like, kind of like, you know, it's okay. And then, you know, in in her behavior, she was very much engaging because she could see that he was upset, I'm sure. And she knew like how bad it was. And, and so then Rosie says it took quite, quite a long time, uh, months. And then he wanted the lo- he wanted to go to the Logan sports state hospital to be closer to the people that he loved. And Dr. Wallace stated, right. and this is right at five thirty-six PM right at the end, right before she left. She said there were residual symptoms where he still wasn't quite right. And then Rosie asked, is he experiencing trauma? And she said, it could be. And right. then. Because they said um, the, the residual effects persisted into the fall. Ah, good. Good note. Um, and so then Dr. Walla was excused. She got up. She walked <laughs> by Richard Allen and said, hey. And, and, and. <laughs> It was like it was hard what? not it was it, it was hard not to take note of um uh, only because I mean it was very warm it was very quick yeah, it was sure. very casual yeah but when she, that was a casual like ca- real but, casual after four hours like I mean it was just a brief moment right she clearly and, had you know you know she was obviously very personable I mean yeah, we just listened to her said, for four um, hours. Right. And you could tell her relationship was with Rick. Um, you know, she feels at least it was comfortable enough that, you know, she sat there and, and, and if you're in, if you're in the witness box, um, in the Carroll County courthouse, 
you, um, and you look straight ahead of you. I mean, the defendant, mm -hmm. is, I mean, Richard Allen yeah. was directly in front of her. Exactly. And then yeah. I was directly behind Richard Allen. So I had a, a yeah. line of sight the whole time. And she yeah. spent a lot of time looking directly sure. at him. Yeah, she did. But, but when she got up and she, um, and she even like kind of threw her hand up a little bit as like kind of like a, it's like when you, you're walking your dog and you see a neighbor and you're like, hey. Yeah. Um, and your hand goes up a little bit. Um, yeah. I, I couldn't see his response. Like, I couldn't see if he yeah. responded or yeah, reacted. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause there was, there was like, it was like, whoa. <laughs> and because, yeah. And then so, and at that point, then her and her lawyer had left the room. So, um, so I specifically looked over I, at Kathy and Janice when this okay. transpired. Okay. And I just want to say that Kathy had, and, and everyone that was around behind our friends that were behind them also have, you know, discussed this, but, but Jan Janice is, has her, her left hand over on Kathy's left knee and she's rubbing it like in comfort. And Kathy is leaning on Janice's shoulder. Like she's right over on her shoulder. And, it, you know, and it was just, it had been a very, it be, had been very difficult testimony for them to listen to um, yes. because it was obviously a very traumatic time. Um, yeah. And then just one thing that happened, there was a thumb drive yeah. that was exam, um, uh, exhibit C is what I have, but Okay. I think we were into the double digits, so it must have been CC. And that included a compilation of all the exhibits that they were aware of with respect to calls and uh, yeah, Richard we, we talked Allen's to, letter. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Was that the one that um, Brad Rosie had presented the thumb drive to um, to oh, Gull from earlier that No, earlier that morning. Um, mm -hmm. He presented it to her. Um, and it apparently, it, it apparently had all of the... Um, the confessions or incriminating statements, oh, whatever you want. Okay, um, I missed that, I guess. And so I, I, they referenced that. Um, and then I know that um, that I that was the day that um, that Kathy and Janice also had a, um, a, a you know a family friend of theirs with them. Um, I didn't see them like overly interacting. Um, like they, you know, they definitely kind of seemed to all be going through their own experience in that. Um, and Janice, I felt like looked a little bit more stoic through a lot of it. Yeah. Um, that day she did. That um, afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was not easy, but um, but yeah. So I mean, we spent literally four four and a half hours, um, um, listening to um the testimony by Dr. Walla, and like I said, I thought this was probably the strongest um, um, portion, um, especially for Brad Rosie when he was doing, um. I thought he did a really good job as far as mm -hmm. the way he would he was able to pivot between yes. ha having his own witness yeah. present kind of the facts he wanted out there, um, but yet then still kind of hold our feet to the fire over the things mm -hmm. that that yeah that um and I will say that um, I thought attorney um, Diener um, is I mean if you, just looking at her I, I mean she has a presence about her like she has a lot of confidence she stands mm -hmm. very in control. She's in, she seems incredibly intelligent and smart. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I did think, and this was a personal thing for me, was just that I felt like her pacing when she was doing her um, questioning of Dr. Walla was in, I thought it was incredibly slow. I thought she um, would take very long pauses in between the questions she would ask, and uh, and I took it was a little distracting to me because. I felt like it would just kind of like cut the pace um, slower than, you know, but I'm sure she was just trying to make sure she, the questions she was asking were the relevant, you know, um, pertinent ones to ask. But yeah, those, were, I mean, those were only the, uh, those, those were the only like, you know, personal ob uh, um, observations I made, um, you know, over the, over their um, performances that day or that, during that witness. You had mentioned that to me that day, and 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 I found her to be methodical um, and careful to get it right and make sure that she covered everything that she wanted to. And I yes, agree. she was pulling reports out of that binder. Maybe, maybe I guess maybe she could have had them already pulled out or whatever. But like the, it was a huge stack of report. Like it was, no, I, you know, I, it was a good. Yeah, yeah, and then therein lies, you know, and we're back to um, the perception of things, and yeah. that's why it's, you know that that's why I said I, I mean I understand she was 
you know, she's qualified. Yeah. She was being, you know, oh, yeah. she, um, you know, she yeah. was doing what you're, you know, what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I just know for myself, you know, as someone with ADHD who'd been sitting in a courtroom at that point for eight hours, I was like, come on, your pacing is distracting me. But so, like I said, per, just a total personal um, thing. And, um, and I didn't notice it any other time during the three days with her. Um, right. It was just during that testimony. Um, um, and like I said, I thought Brad, Brad Rosie did a very good job during that. I thought it was his strongest, um, performance um of the three days yeah yeah definitely and not I mean, that I, my opinion matters but <laughs> yeah well from the perspective of the common person observing <laughs> listening right thinking about these things i mean just from the perspective of how a juror will feel sitting there taking in this information and experiences that you, you have these types of you know, feelings and thoughts towards the presentation style. We've certainly, we've talked about it before. We've seen Absolutely. how the, the, those types of things can affect uh, jurors, but I don't think like what you say, and you've made this point. Well, that was, that was kind of the only time where, where we did see Diener be a little bit more slow in her presentation. So over the course of three or four weeks, you know, if an attorney has one or two days or whatever where they've where they're grading on the juror who maybe hasn't had enough sleep or is overwhelmed by the scientific test testimony or whatever, you, just, you never know. Or wants to go smoke, know, but, but, or wants to go smoke a cigarette or needs to go to the bathroom. <laughs> any, you know, anything. Right. Right. Yeah. And, but my point being. It, the issue, I think, and it can it can become an issue. I think a little bit, like just, I mean, you know, maybe not. You know, I don't know. I this gets into psychology, but I do think that people can kind of, if they really have a strong reaction to the way that an attorney presents a case in court, that it, you know, it, it's right. possible it affects their the rationale to, you know, take in the facts in in an, in an unbiased way. And again, we, you know, and we talked about that in one of the other videos already. And I, and I brought up the example of Elaine from the Johnny Depp trial. Um, And I'm not, I'm not comparing um, um, Dina to um, to (laughs) Elaine at all. I think Dina was great, but um, um, you know, it can be, you know, a takeaway that, you know, people have. And, and like I said, you know, you can go to law school, you can get as many credentials as you want, but, when you're the 12 people that are sitting there deciding on the fate of an individual, it, it's interesting to think of the fact that just those little things also go into their heads, yeah. even though they're not supposed to like, yeah. you know, I mean, I get it, yeah. but um, anyway, human. we've, we've kept everyone for two and a half hours. Is there anything, we did well. is there anything that, um, before that was, we, that was a good we, run through for Dr. Wall. I thought, I thought so too. Um, Hopefully the, the listeners agree. <laughs> I'm, they probably just tuned us out at this point. <laughs> um, you think you think? Yeah, maybe. So yeah, no I mean, drama. there's no, like we've had no drama discussion or anything else. Well, wait till wait till you they do live with the live premieres. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so um, yeah, but I mean, we didn't even take a break or anything after that. I mean, they literally just jumped right into the Brian Harshman testimony, um, and I found it interesting that. At this point in the day, um, I noticed several people leave. Um, and so I think, I guess they just had um, long days. I think some of the some of the journalists from the news media probably had to get outside to do their six o'clock pickup shots and like their reports. Yeah. Um, so and YouTubers, I think. Yeah. So, and, you know, sadly, I, 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 you know, I think Harshman was probably one of the, it was a witness that I Oh, you wouldn't want to miss him. Brian Harshman is the witness. I never knew I wanted to hear every word yeah. they had to say, yeah. but I wanted to hear every word he had to say. Yeah, yeah he was excellent. And what he well, had to say was yeah. very important information. Absolutely. But we'll get into that in the next video. So, um, Turbo, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's fun, Aspen. We're going to get these knocked out and then we're going to release them in, in rapid fire. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Yep. So we will all see you, see you um, in, the, in the next video, which will be um, day two, part three. Um, and that'll be for the Brian Harshman testimony. Um, but anyway, everyone Thank have a great you. day. Thank you.